Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or have already been here and haven't done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help push this video into the algorithm and help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and an ad will play, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Quick note, right after the first story, I'll be reading one massive story that's been broken into five parts. I will let you know when I come up on part one, two, three, four, and five. Cool? Let's get started, shall we? As much as I hear these stories, I wish more of them had an explanation for the occurrence. So I tell a story where I found out what was really going on. I have been backpacking my whole life and in very comfortable and secluded places. About a year ago, I went on a two night trip with some friends in the Southwestern US. We arrived at the trailhead late afternoon and decided to camp about a fourth of a mile up the trail at a small area with three tent sites. Next to our site was a barren stream with a small hill. At the top you could see the silhouette of a little cottage. After getting set up and eating dinner, we cracked a few cold ones open and sat around the fire as per usual. A little time passed and we hear some activity coming from where the cabin is. At first it was just chatter of voices, but soon changed into some sort of group laughter. Almost like a chant. It was a very forced laugh with several people in unison, which lasted about 5 to 10 seconds. Pause and start again. At first, we assumed someone cracked a good joke at the cabin, but after 30 minutes or so, it became very, very weird. At this point, it is quite late, probably around 11 p.m., and we decided we had to find out what was going on. We crept across the barren river and up the hill, almost to the crest, where we then peered over. We were able to make out about 20 people sitting in a circle laughing in rhythm with one another. I want to make it clear it was a very creepy laugh. Not the natural type, more of a... <laughs> Anyways, we head back to our site and write it off as some weird shit but probably nothing to be worried about. Before sleeping, we went down to where we parked and sparked up a joint. Out of the woods came two guys, seemingly from the direction the cabin was in. One of my friends goes, Hey, were you the guys at the cabin up there? And the individuals responded, Yes. My friend continues, What were you guys doing up there? And the guy responds, It was a Native American celebration for the full moon. It was not a full moon, by the way. Finally, my friend asks, how do you get involved with that? And the guy responds, you can sign up online. It only costs $50 and includes a dinner. The two individuals drove off and we returned to our campsite laughing about the whole situation. All in all, it was definitely a bit strange, but nothing serious. Also, I took a video of the laughter when we approached. If you would like to see it, just let me know. Alrighty, dear listeners, make sure you're tucked in and comfortable. Here is that long story. Part 1 
The Okefenokee Swamp is located mostly in South Georgia and partly in North Florida. I'd been going there since I was a kid. My dad and uncle were avid outdoorsmen. They were always canoeing, hiking, hunting, fishing, etc. And I grew up learning to love the same things. Now, if the first thing that came to your mind when I said swamp was alligators, you would be correct. And the Okefenokee has some of the biggest around. It may sound super scary to non-Southerners, but the old saying really is true. If you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Canoeing slowly across the dark, tea-colored waters, if you pass too closely to one, it will quietly sink into the murky depths. He's not coming to get you. You've simply interrupted his sunbathing. As elementary school kids in South Georgia, it was kind of a rite of passage to go on the Okefenokee field trip and be led on a guided tour by Okefenokee Joe. Joe was a true outdoorsman, extremely knowledgeable, friendly, good with the kids, and very funny. A little strange, but generally regarded as a good guy. A local legend, if you will. He would get the boat closer to the big gators than my dad ever let me get. He taught us kids all about them. We even got to hear the mating call of some of the males and watched a lot of their behavior up close. He would also show us all the birds, snakes, and other wildlife. The camp's residents were so used to Joe's boat that they didn't even flee when he got close. Oh, the great memories. Anyhow, fast forward to my adulthood and I still have a great love for the outdoors. I'd recently gotten married and was successfully getting my wife and stepdaughter into kayaking, camping, and hiking. I'd broken them in fairly easily. Calm lakes and beautiful crystal clear blue spring fed Florida waterways. We'd encountered some gators, but the girls already became comfortable with the fact that they don't want to hurt humans. I decided it was time to go out to the Okefenokee and show them my childhood swamp, Stomping Grounds. We headed out one weekend, kind of on a whim. I hadn't called ahead to reserve a campsite, but I assumed it wouldn't be that busy yet. Part 2 Well, I was wrong. Every tent camping site was booked. I was pretty visibly bummed out, so I guess the ranger felt sorry for me. She told us to hold on. She was going to check one more thing. When she came back, she had great news. There was a primitive group site available. If you aren't familiar, these are larger sites that are usually for big groups like Boy Scouts, usually situated away from the main campground areas. They do not have electricity. We camp 100% primitive all the time, so this wasn't an issue for us at all. The ranger explained that this particular group site had been closed for two seasons due to the road being washed out. She said that they had just fixed the road the week before, but hadn't gotten around to relisting the site as available. She offered to sell it to us for a normal fee instead of the group fee. Deal? We pay and she vaguely shows us on the map how to get to our home for the night. I remember thinking, damn, that's far from hell from all the other sites. It's going to be nice and quiet, though. Perfect. While at the office, we learned that that evening there was going to be a ranger-guided night paddle. This particular park inside the Okefenokee is a designated dark sky park, meaning there is very little light pollution. I was already excited about showing my family the stars and the Milky Way. So getting out onto the water at night and seeing the skies, that way sounded sweet. 
We decided to sign up for the night paddle and then headed off to find our campsite. When we got there, you could tell right away that the area hadn't been used in several years. Overgrown, spider webs everywhere, teeming with the usual wildlife. I kind of prefer things this way, so I didn't think twice about it. It was so far from the campgrounds and the main office area, you couldn't hear a single sound of humans or vehicles. The area was large, so I walked around a bit to find a good spot to set up. I looked back at my map to try and gauge exactly how this little island was shaped and noticed that what I was seeing and what the map showed didn't quite line up. Whatever. I'm sure I'm just reading it wrong. We set up our camp and just enjoyed the sunshine and the sounds of nature. It was still very early spring, so the hordes of mosquitoes and various other swamp bugs weren't out in full force yet. The bugs in the swamp in the summer months could be a horror story on their own. Around 7.30 p.m., we loaded the kayaks back onto the pickup and headed all the way across the park to the launch area as our guided paddle was supposed to start at 8. Part 3 We approached the launch area to unload, and there was a good 15 to 20 other people going on the paddle. Led by a young, enthusiastic ranger, we all slipped off into the water with our headlamps on the red light setting. We exit the small canal we had been traveling in, and emerged out into the large river-type waterway that meandered through the swamp. As we slowly and quietly crept along, cypress trees draped with Spanish moss loomed over us on both sides with a dramatic orange and pink sunset as their backdrop. The sun finally began disappearing and the stars started to come out. It was absolutely stunning and still one of my favorite kayaking memories. I've never actually seen the Milky Way like that before. It was a new moon night, dark as could be. About a mile from our original launch, we all congregated out in the middle of the wide waterway and sat completely still and quiet. The motionless dark waters of the swamp reflected the skies like a mirror. Thousands of stars and galaxies twinkled above us and below us too. It was like being in space. Shooting stars were visible every few minutes. It really was magical, and the only artificial light in the sky was the dull glow of Jacksonville, Florida on the horizon, which was about 100 miles to our southeast. After a while, the ranger snapped us all out of our trances as it was time to head back. When we were paddling out there, it had been dusk, or twilight, if you will, for most of the trip. Not much light, but enough to kind of silhouette the trees and branches against the sky and a slight glimmer on the water. But now it was pitch black, and I do mean pitch black. The ranger told us to switch our headlamps back on to their normal white light setting so that we could see well enough to navigate out in the swamp. As each headlamp slowly switched on and the swamp was illuminated, we were met with hundreds of glowing eyes. Hundreds, I swear this to you. Now, as I said earlier, I grew up out here. Gators were nothing new or scary to me at all. However, growing up, we never really stayed out on the water past dark. We would shine our lights out over the water to look at their eyes, but from dry land far away from the beasts. Now, I found myself and my little family quite literally pushing past floating gators with our kayaks. They were absolutely everywhere, all over the sides of the channel, as well as blocking our way in the center. The ranger was leading and assured everyone not to worry. He paddled up towards the huge group of shining eyes ahead of us and pushed right through them. Most of the eyes just disappeared under the water, but the gator directly in the ranger's path 
thrashed, and his tail actually hit the kayak. Holy shit, y'all. Sharp gasps from the group pierced the otherwise quiet southern night air, but the ranger showed zero signs of panic, which was reassuring. We all just trusted the young man that we weren't going to royally piss off these things by kayaking straight into them. As we went along, the sounds of gators being bumped by the kayaks and thrashing were heard every couple of minutes. There weren't any other jarring sounds or movements, just the constant calling of frogs, cicadas, and the splashing of disturbed dinosaurs. When we finally turned back in the small channel that led to the launch, there were no more glowing eyes. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't been a bit freaked out, but I can honestly say I wasn't panicking. The ranger being so cool and confident while leading the way made it pretty easy to stay calm. Everyone started to relax again as we neared the launch, and we all got out, loaded up our boats one by one, heading back to our camps. There was a line of red taillights trailing off toward the main campground, while my wife, daughter, and myself split off alone into the darkness towards the other side of the park where our site was. I do remember that feeling kind of eerie, but everyone had made it through the gator gauntlet safely with no problems. Now, we were laughing about it and remarking on how cool that whole experience was. We were in high spirits, no stress. We had no idea of the terror that would come later in the night. Part 4 We finally got back to our site at around midnight and we were starving. I got a nice fire going while my wife prepped dinner. The meal finished cooking at around 1 a.m., and we finally all settled down to get comfy by the fire and eat. I hadn't taken two bites of my food when the horrifying experience began. The cicadas and frogs were singing, but you tend to drown them out into the background noise because it's so constant. Suddenly, out of the calming buzz of their singing, sprung a sound that I will never ever forget. A low, rumbling, guttural growl, like deep vibrating in our chests. We all froze and looked at each other like, did y'all hear that shit? Not even ten seconds later, we hear it again. Yes, we all definitely fucking heard that shit. It sounded close, and I do mean really close. Like right on the other side of the brush we were camped near. The only thing I could honestly relate it to at the time was the growling sound the T-Rex makes in Jurassic Park. I was terrified. I've been scared in the woods and the swamps. I've seen swamp gas, freaky figures, heard screams. I've been in the Marine Corps. I've encountered bears in the Appalachian Mountains. I've explored and experienced all kinds of places. When I tell you I have never been this scared, I mean it. Pure, raw, primordial fear. I immediately told the girls to get into the cab of my pickup. They get in the truck, and I hop into the bed of the truck with my little 357 Magnum drawn. I figured being back there would get me up off the ground and give me a little advantage over whatever was coming. I told the girls to lock the doors and open the little sliding back window so we could communicate. I start frantically shining my flashlight everywhere, aiming my gun along with it. I see absolutely nothing. We continue to hear the growling coming from one general direction, not getting any softer or louder, just continuously emitting in three to five second long intervals every 30 seconds or so. It was coming from the brush right next to our site. I shine my light all over that area, but I see nothing, just thick palmetto leaves, underbrush and pine. No movement whatsoever. 
Then, suddenly, we hear the sound coming from the complete opposite direction, more towards the open area of our sight. I whip around and shine my light that way, and that's when I noticed the dense fog that had settled onto the entire area. It was a damp, sticky, suffocating fog. Almost right away, the growling sound was coming back from the original direction. I whip around, but immediately I hear it again behind me again. That's when I realize that there were two of them doing a kind of call and answer with each other. That's also when I realized that the other sounds of the swamp had gone silent. Nothing but the call and answer of whatever was making these absolutely gut-wrenching sounds. I got deafeningly quiet for a moment. Nothing but the heavy fog which seemed to have a silent sound of its own. My wife, with a shaky, trembling voice, told me she wanted to leave immediately and that our daughter agreed. Now, I was absolutely terrified. Do not misunderstand this, however. The thought of just leaving all of my expensive camping gear behind was somehow more offensive. Not to mention, I was getting kind of frustrated. I'm at home in this damn swamp. I know all of the creatures here. I'm comfortable here. It's borderline pissing me off that something out there has me so scared and confused. I start trying to rationalize what could be making the sound. Suddenly, it started back up again, but now it sounds like there could be four or five of them, all growling back and forth to each other, overlapping each other now, coming from all sides. A demonic chorus of deep, rattling, soul-sucking rumbles. Not getting any closer or further away, just keeping us closely surrounded. If I'd had to have taken a shit, I believe I would have shat myself. I kept myself at least somewhat cool by affirming that it must be animals of some kind. I wouldn't even entertain the thought of anything supernatural or cryptic. It's not that I don't believe in that stuff. I really do. I was just trying to not freak out. My wife kept saying it sounded like a big cat. And while I agreed, I knew that just wasn't it. It would have had to be massive lions or tigers to make that kind of extremely low rumbling growl. Impossible. I racked my brain for the biggest animal it could have been and I just kept landing on alligator. Yet, we had just paddled directly through an entire swamp of them. Some of them absolutely massive, and they hadn't made a single sound the whole time we were out on the water. No, that couldn't be it. I even had a thought that the young, playful ranger had orchestrated some kind of extravagant practical joke on us poor campers out here all alone. Really and truly, I had no fucking idea what it was, and not being able to see a glimpse so I could take a shot at it to protect my family was a very helpless feeling. I really wish I had more words for how it felt, just blindingly standing in the back of that truck, hearing what I could only imagine was the scariest, evilest, most vile things on the planet. Just knowing that they wanted to kill, eat, or otherwise mutilate myself and my family. Part 5 It felt like an eternity, but we'd probably only been holed up in my truck for about 10 to 15 minutes by now. It had finally gone quiet again, and I told the girls that we could leave. But I'm not leaving the gear. I climbed into the cab and started the truck and moved it positioning it to where I could shine the headlights onto our stuff while I was packing it up. Gun in hand, I began rolling up the tent, gathering all of our shit and throwing it into the bed of the truck. Praying nothing happened like my truck dying or some other perfectly timed cinematic horror moment. I tried to put on a confident air around me as so not to scare my family. 
But in my head, I felt so fucking vulnerable, like I was something's prey. The growling still hadn't come back, but honestly, the silence was freaking me out more than anything. And the fog. I'll never forget how oppressive that fog felt. All of our gear was sopping wet with it, and I swear it was hard to breathe the air. The fire was nothing but a smolder, despite the fact that it had been roaring and bright 20 minutes ago. Just as I was rolling up my very last sleeping mat, one final, closer than before growl shook me to my core. I snatched that mat up and took off running, getting into the truck, Dukes of Hazard style, and taking the fuck off. None of us looked back. I had filmed some of what happened to us and put it on my YouTube page. Come to find out, they were large male alligators. That sound is their mating call. The louder, lower, and scarier sounding, the more the female gator finds it attractive. Those must have been the swamp's sexiest alligators because I had never heard this sound in all of my life. I had been under the impression that I knew what their mating call sounded like from my childhood experiences in Okie Finoki Joe's boat and with my father and uncle. These gators must have been absolutely massive to produce the sounds we were hearing because it was nothing like what I had ever heard in that swamp. It was exactly like that video, but I'm telling you, in person, you can physically feel it rattling your insides. Though I was somewhat comforted by the fact that the noises were just gators flirting, and they weren't being aggressive towards us. My wife and daughter still think we were in danger because we were so close. I'm still not sure about that part. I got onto Google Maps and tried to find out exactly where we were camped, because from looking at it at the map the ranger had given us, we shouldn't have been that close to the water. I never could quite figure out where we ended up at. I don't know if it was us being in the wrong place or the fact that the area hadn't had any human activity for two years, or a combination of both that put us so close to all of this mating activity that wouldn't normally happen near areas with lots of humans. Either way, it made for a heart-pounding experience that we still talk about to this day. Also, as a small funny addition to the story looking back, the most hilarious thing was that my daughter was eating corn on the cob at the time we heard that sound, and it was still in her hands. So during this entire event of being terrified and hearing those growls, <laughs> she still had corn on the cob in her hand. <laughs> I hope this wasn't too long. I enjoy writing and I just wanted to really set the tone and events of the night. I also hope my story wasn't a disappointment to the listeners here considering the ending had a definite answer and it was nothing really all that creepy after all. But I can assure you though that the fear and adrenaline in the moment where we really, really were, imagine hearing that sound in the pitch black of night of the Okefenokee Swamp and not knowing what in the hell it was. Looking back, I suppose the fog settling in on us that exact moment all the growling started was just a coincidence, but it sure didn't make the whole thing that much scarier. I will never forget that particular kind of fear I experienced that night. This event occurred in early fall of 1971 or 1972. I'm not sure what jogged this memory, but it's probably something to do with some of Reddit's off the grid weirdness. Also, some of the details are a bit gray, but the gist of the story begins here. I grew up in the Philly suburbs. The Boy Scouts were popular then, and I was quite active, especially with camping. One of the go-to areas was the New Jersey Pine Barrens, 
especially along the Wading River and Bass River State Forest, onto the man. Our patrol was on a weekend camping trip at the South Shore Campground. I think that's what it was called. Lots of pine breaks, but even more swamps and bogs and boggy swamps. Our patrol, probably seven of us plus one guy's dad who drove us, was assigned a three-sided shelter. The front of the shelter opened to, well, the swamp. If you walked 11 feet from the front of the shelter, you'd be standing in ankle deep water. And then it just got deeper and darker and boggier. We mucked about Saturday until late afternoon, made our way back to the shelter, cooked dinner and chilled until it got dark. And when I say dark, it was crazy dark. No other campers around, just the light of our slowly dying fire. We began to hear a loud splashing sound coming from the swamp, maybe a hundred feet from our fire. One of the guys yelled something towards the sound and everything went quiet. A minute later, the splashing began again, but slower and methodical. By this time, it was within 15 feet of the fire, but was out of the fire's light. Here's what our vibe was. None of us were concerned. We were all seasoned campers and figured it was a deer or raccoon looking to score an easy meal. Suddenly, the walking became a slow, steady sloshing. This perked us up wondering if this thing may suddenly decide to rush us. Our patrol leader jumped up, grabbed his flashlight, and pointed it toward the noise. His light hit something. He yelled, It's a man! and ran to the swamp berm. I saw a brief flash of red flannel in the flashlight beam, then heard fast splashing back into the swamp. The splashing eventually faded out in the darkness. So, what did we do? Tried to figure out what the hell just happened, then crawled into our sleeping bags and fell asleep. Nothing else happened and we went home the next day as scheduled. Thinking back on this now, it must have been a local piney. Who knew the area well? The man had to navigate through some serious and dangerous swamps to check us out. The pines have great and eerie vibes, and that weekend held both. I don't really believe in the paranormal, but it still fascinates me. I keep an open mind, even if my default is apprehension or disbelief because I like the idea that extraordinary things can happen to people. It's interesting, if that makes sense. However, there is one scenario that happened to me that I still cannot explain to this day. This happened some years ago. I went to visit a friend some four to five hours away. I was 21 or 22. This was my first time traveling to visit friends at this distance. I'd never even taken a train before. My friend used to live in the city, but his family moved when we were younger. Still kept in touch, he'd visit sometimes. And this was the first time I visit him. His family lives in a much smaller town, and it was only fairly rural. Behind his house was an area of untamed wilderness, I'll call a forest for clarity even if it probably didn't classify as one. Just lots of trees and brush left unmaintained and to nature. It was their house, then 30 to 40 feet into a chicken wire fence, and then a further 250 to 300 feet is where you start entering the forest. My friend and his siblings alleged if you left a belonging on the other side of the fence, not necessarily in the forest. It would be returned to you sometime later. I love it. Super cryptic and of low stakes. I'll run with their story for now. There's other stories they've told me, but other 
things about the forest, but I'll just focus on this one for now. First night I was there, I threw a hat I had brought across the fence, and a few hours later, my friend told me he found it up on the porch. This didn't seem like proof or anything to me. I assumed he was just messing with me. I tried again, the same night, monitoring my friend in the process, and when he went out to have a cigarette, I found the hat on the porch. Whatever, one of his siblings could be in on the prank. The second night, unbeknownst to my friend, I took a belt buckle of his and threw it as far as I could across the fence. And again, it suffered the same fate on their front porch just a couple of hours later. I still wasn't super convinced. Maybe someone saw me and quickly went looking. At this point, I started to get creeped out, but my disbelief still prevailed. The third night, we decided to go into the forest. It was me, my friend, and my friend's friend. We climbed over the fence, start walking towards the forest, and get about 50 feet deep in when all of our flashlights went off in unison. My friend yelled for us to run back, and I didn't question it. I bolted. However, in the process, I dropped my hat. I was fidgeting with it as we walked. When we got back into the house, my hat was inside, and their basement in my suitcase zipped up. This shook me greatly because my friend already had a sizable head start versus me when we all ran. There's no way he could have got back to the hat to pick it up. I was with him when we all reached the house. Compounding this, we ran a straight line right back to the house. There's no way someone could have grabbed it and ran a different route to beat us home. And to top it all off, we locked the house before we embarked on our night walk. And it wasn't a duplicate hat either, unless they managed to replicate the wear and tear of my hat to the T for this one gotcha. We didn't talk about it. I was done with it and wanted nothing more to do with the forest. We all basically went, oh, so this just happened and just dropped it completely. I left my hat with him when I left for home, half hoping and half dreading it would find its way back with me at home later, but it never did. My friend and I kind of fell out of favor with each other for unrelated reasons shortly after this. If we ever reconcile, and it's been years since, I want to talk with him about this and maybe even visit again. Their stories of occurrences in this forest are numerous, and if just for my curiosity, I'd love to explore this more. The following is a story that took place quite a few years back. However, it still baffles me completely. I'm a teenager, and I've been in scouting and Boy Scouts for nearly all my life, and I really enjoy exploring with my friends and being trusted more as I'm older now. A few years ago, me and two girls named Amy and Harriet were asked to head into the woods surrounding our campsite to find a long, straight stick suitable for carving into a point. Bear in mind that I was a lot younger back then. Harriet was older and Amy only one year older than myself. We had been walking in deliberately the same direction as to not get lost and memorizing the surroundings as we went in order to find our way back safely and easily. About 15 minutes in, we couldn't find anything to take back, so we turned around and returned to the campsite. That's when the initial panic set in. The trees had almost unnaturally knitted themselves together in such a way that it seemed our path was non-existent in the first place, like it had just vanished. We looked around 360 degrees, and now everything looked exactly the same. 
trees we could have sworn were different from one another appeared as all copies of the same tree. We kept walking in what we thought to be the correct direction, whilst shouting out for help, and eventually came to a concrete path, almost like a road but very thin, separating the forest, splitting it into two. We didn't follow the road as it went the wrong direction of our campsite. On the other side of the path was more forest. However, nearby was an abandoned shack, likely used for storage or whatever else. We had no idea anything like this was out here in these woods, so we just kept walking. We eventually came to a road we didn't recognize. A woman wearing a pink and purple regatta outdoors coat walked past, and we frantically asked her for the direction of our campsite, as by now, according to our watches and Harriet's phone, we'd been walking for over an hour and a half. She said she'd never seen us before, but said there's another campsite in, quote, quote, that direction. We followed her advice and eventually came back to our campsite. We frantically apologized for being so long and that we couldn't find anything. The leader, Ian, could see all three of us were shaken up, and he stated, confused, that we'd only been gone 25 minutes and that our free time was still going on. To this day, this baffles all three of us, as our free time was 40 minutes long, and our watches and phones had said we'd been gone for hours. The forest we were lost in felt crushing and claustrophobic, like we'd entered into an area that the concept of time didn't apply to. I believe in the paranormal, however, this was so unlike anything I've ever heard or experience before. It was literally like we'd been in a time vortex or something, and that hours in the forest were only minutes in the rest of the world. The feeling was very strange, and it stuck with me for the rest of our camp. This has been a doozy. My boyfriend and I solidly freaked out, and what happened the last two nights has me convinced something bad is in the woods behind his house. For context, my boyfriend lives in northeastern Pennsylvania in the boonies. He has an expanse of at least 500 acres of woods behind his home. There was no power sources for any structures in the woods and the man who owns that property already told us there is nothing out there that he was aware of that could be causing any of this. We have talked to the neighbors and they are just as confused as us. For the last month, we have been seeing a bright light in the middle of the woods behind my boyfriend's house. I want to say maybe three fourths of a mile away, bright and big enough to see through the trees. It comes on at around dusk and goes out at around 10 p.m. It's in the same spot every single night. We had gone out during the day to investigate if there were any power lines or deer stands with solar lights on them, but we found nothing, just wilderness. Last night, my boyfriend decides to go out and investigate on his own. I asked him not to go alone, but he armed himself to the teeth with firearms and made his way out into the dark after spotting the light. He gets about 200 yards from where the light is and it vanishes. Gone. Does a whole 360 to look for it and sees nothing. He is texting me during all of this and immediately I told him to get the hell out of there. The night previous I had been over, and around 9.30, we pulled up to the house after getting something to eat, and I looked into the woods. I did not see the light, but I was immediately gripped with the primal fear something was watching us. I was so terrified once I got inside the house, I couldn't look through the windows without wanting to burst into tears. 
I had never experienced that fear at his home before. I'm used to his woods in the dark, but this was different. So he heeds my warning and starts trekking back to his house. He gets up a hill about halfway back and turns to see the light has reappeared, only it's much lower to the ground. He watches it for a while and it begins to move through the trees. Behind his property is a large pipeline, right of way, so there is an open kind of field before the tree line, and it comes through the tree line and into the field at the bottom of this hill. He watches it, tells me it's moving very slowly, but the light is bright and large. He says the wind was blowing and swirling around him, but nothing was blowing directly on him and he felt like he was being watched. The light begins to move up the hill towards him and he makes a run back to his house and jumps into his truck because whatever it is, he doesn't want it to follow him inside the house. Now, his vehicle is backed into the driveway and facing away from the woods so he can see what's going on in his rear view mirrors. He sits for 10 minutes and says the eerie feeling is gone. I tell him to wait. He begins to see flashes of light. He's on the phone with me at this point and he sounds scared. And he's pretty damn fearless. I've never heard of him this worried. Then he says he saw a figure pass in front of a mower he is sitting in the yard that he can see in the rear view. It's here. Something is here. This rifle isn't going to do a damn thing. He sits in silence with me on the phone. Something passed in front of the streetlight. Something is making a shadow on the streetlight. Mind you, it's only his house and his neighbor's house across the street about 200 yards away. One streetlight at the right corner of his house. There's shadows passing through this light at about 10 feet up in the air. I tell him to put on his late grandfather's coat and make a run for the house. He gets inside and said the feeling is still with him. His dog isn't acting strange, but his bedroom door is wide open and so is his basement door. His entire house was locked up tight when we left and his basement door is always shut. It swings out too, so the dog couldn't have done it. And his bedroom door was shut before he left. Swings in, but was the latch closed. Again, the dog cannot open it. Nothing else seemed to transpire for the rest of the evening, and we didn't see anything weird outside of the windows. By this time, after the adventure was over, it was about 10 p.m. This all transpired over about two and a half to three hours. So it's safe to say we will probably be heading out again sometime later this week together and trying to find out what that light is. It made no noise, was way too big to be a flashlight, and we are just scared out of our wits and dumbfounded as to what it could be. With that being said, the floor is open to theories or other experiences you may have. I will preface this by stating that the information I'm about to share with you is not a creepypasta or any other form of fiction. It is, in fact, my complete and honest recollection of the unexplained experiences I observed in and around the wooded area behind my childhood home. Other people in my family noted much of the same while growing up there, and our stories match now that we are all decades older. I'm not saying I believe in skinwalkers, sasquatches, or any other cryptids, as I am a man of science. I cannot ignore the lack of reliable and testable evidence in regards to such creatures actually existing. That being said, something very terrifying and unexplained lived or lives in the woods behind that house.
Occurrence number one. My sister and I had just received a tent as a gift from our grandfather. He had smoked enough Marlboro cigarettes and sent in the UPCs to get us a massive Marlboro tent. My mother hated it. We, however, loved it and immediately set it up on the property line behind the house. We intended on spending the night out there, but after about an hour or so, we experienced something neither of us can explain to this day. We saw an indention drag itself across the tent and heard it dragging as it went. It was like a giant finger or maybe a log something of that size. My sister cried out and I immediately bolted outside as I was convinced it was our father playing a prank on us. Upon exiting the tent, I was greeted by nothing. There was nothing there. I searched the entire area briefly before grabbing my sister and going inside for the evening. About a week later, I ventured out to the tent again only to realize it was gone. I ran inside and asked my mother where the tent was, and she replied that she had thrown it away because it had tears in it. Confused, I tried to convince myself she was lying, and had just tossed it out because she was a non-smoker and thought the tent looked trashy, but I feared she was telling the truth. Occurrence number two. One fall morning, about an hour before my alarm for school went off, I was jolted out of my bed by what I can only describe as an otherworldly shriek. It came from the woods. It didn't sound human, and it didn't sound animal either. Foxes and coyotes live in those woods, but they didn't make those kind of sounds. It was insanely loud. Occurrence number three. One evening, my father and I were up late having one of our classic all-night arguments. As we finally wrapped up our fight at around 3 a.m., my father said he wanted to read a verse from the Bible in order to close on a positive note of peace. As he began to read aloud, that same, or at least very, very similar, otherworldly shriek boomed through the house. It had to be just outside the kitchen window but it was so loud that it sounded almost like it was inside of the house. We immediately ran around the house trying to find out what the hell was making such a noise, and it even awoke my siblings and mother, who helped in the confused search. After about half an hour, we all just sort of gave up and went to bed, scratching our heads. Occurrence number four. In my senior year of high school, I got a cat. She was an outdoor cat, but we would let her into the garage to sleep every night, mostly due to the coyotes and potentially bad weather and whatnot. She would always come home before we shut the garage doors because she didn't want to be locked out. One night, she didn't show. I didn't think much of it as cats sometimes go on a long hunting and mating, etc. excursions only to return in two to three days later like nothing happened. I assumed this was the case. After not seeing her for a week, I went and explored the area behind my house, the fields, and of course, the woods. I think I found her. I say I think, because I honestly couldn't tell. It looked like her, but she had been seemingly turned inside out. I stared at the remains for about a minute before turning back and going home. I know this was a long read, and if you've stuck it out this far, I thank you for your time and interest. If you can shed any light on what kind of animal or being or whatever, please don't hesitate to share or speculate. My family, especially myself, would love to know what exactly is in those woods. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true backwoods creepy stories. I'd like to take a special moment and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. 
Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Les Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Sneeze. Thank you all so much for being the special reform members of Back to Ashes. If you are asleep, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.